Hello, everybody. It's Pastor Tom of the 24 Today podcast. Today, I'm excited to tell you that my special guest is Jim Burns. Jim is an award-winning author. He is a pastor. He has spoken to literally thousands and thousands of people over his years of ministry. One of the things that he does so well is that he ministers to teenagers and also their families. So I am having him talk today with us about his book called Understanding Your Teen. It's an excellent book. I have uh, read it and I know that it will be helpful for you as well. Uh, we're going to talk about social media and how to, to just get a better understanding of that for parents and for grandparents and for all of those that have teens in our lives. Now let's get right to the interview with Jim Burns. Pastor Tom, great to be with you. This is fun. We have all this connection because of your youth ministry. We do. Program. I was a youth minister and uh, I'm losing my hair and all of that stuff. So we well, we got to yeah. lose your hair if you're going to work with kids. Uh, that's yeah, I know hard. that that's was kind of like the last straw for me to say. Well, I need to switch over. <laughs> we got a lot more hair than I do. Well, yeah. anyway, all right, Jim. Here we go. This is directly from your book. And by the way, your book that I'm referring to is Understanding Your Teen. Got it. I've read it. It's a it's a wonderful book, really good read. If you are a parent, if you're a grandparent, a uh, friend of someone that has a teen and they're kind of struggling, this is the book that you want to get. It's so uh, well written, so many good things in there. But this is right from your book, and it goes like this. Yes, we were all teenagers once upon a time. All of us have been 13, 15, and 18, but because so much has changed in our society and culture over the years, none of us has experienced adolescence the same way our kids will. And certainly none of us know what it is like to be a teenager today. So even though we were all teenagers once, we were never the age of today's teens. They experience so much at an earlier age than we did. Tell me about that thought and what you're thinking when you wrote that. Well, in some ways, Tom, that was the basis for what we're talking about when we have to understand teens. Because a lot of us, as parents, we go back to what we were like when we were teens. And, you know, there was peer pressure, obviously, there. There was sexual temptation. There was drug and alcohol abuse and use. And, you know, there were all those kind of things that just happens younger. For example, let's, we were just talking about alcohol. When Jimmy Burns, that would be me, graduated from Anaheim High School in the shadows of Disneyland. I grew up in Anaheim, yes. California. Uh, the average first drink was 14 and a half. Today it's age 12. Mm. Um, there was no such thing as vaping because we didn't know what, I mean, there was, there was no vaping right. today. Kids sure. Thing. Absolutely. Uh, there was literally no social media. So as a parent, I didn't have to know if Snapchat or Facebook or mm -hmm. Instagram was a good thing or a bad thing because mm -hmm. that wasn't it. Today, the first uh, time a kid is going to see pornography is age 11. Now, notice that I didn't say some kids. The average in America is age 11. So it's going to be the greatest uh, device that they're going to see is their mobile phone. They're going to see it on their mobile phone. But today, it's, it's so much more prevalent. So what I'm trying to say there is it's not all bad. But it's not all good either, but it is, they're experiencing younger. And, and that's both for guys and girls. Uh, media has changed the way we look at life today. And, you know, media has obviously changed big time just in the last 10 years. So, again, if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're tuning in, you have a teenager, a uh, grandparent of a teenager, we are going to talk uh, specifically about trying to create a media safe home. Really, media is the thing that. It has brought it on so rapidly, so quickly. Um, so, Jim, this is also from, from your book. It's another uh, quote. and You say, just recently, the speaker at a conference in Louisiana asked the high school guys, how many of you have not seen pornography? Not one guy raised his hand. They had all viewed pornography at least once. So uh, that's very different than yeah. from when you and I. Sure, were. It, it is different. And again, I, I was I have a I had a radio broadcaster, and I was interviewing Michael Landon Jr., who mm -hmm. you know his dad was a big time actor, and he's a producer. He happens to be a Christian. We were talking about this very subject, and he said, "Well, it's the death of innocence." 
I said, well, unpack that for me. And what he was basically saying is today's kids are innocent. You can get through. I, I remember as a youth speaker, I used to speak to about a quarter of a million kids a year in places that where you lived, Indianapolis right. and, and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. and I used to say right. to my wife, you know, these kids are a little bit more innocent in some of the Midwest towns, say, than where I was living in Southern California or New York sure. City or mm -hmm. Chicago. Where. Mm -hmm. But what was fascinating is, is that's not the case as much right. anymore because they, are, they have access to so much. So what we see happening with, say, pornography is they're not all bad kids, but they are going to see a pop-up. They are. It's going to show on uh, television today, uh, 14,000 acts of intercourse or innuendo to intercourse on primetime TV. So as parents, it used to be, my parents never talked to me about this stuff. Sure. And they kind of get away with it, even though my parents, I, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. But today, parents have to be proactive about setting up a media safe home. And mm -hmm. if they just put their head in the sand, or if they just you know, go totally lenient, that's not going to work either because literally they're trying to help their kids from the incredible visual impact in their life. For example, the, the pornography, mm -hmm. when that, uh, there was a youth pad, I was, I was speaking at that event too. It, it, we have a, a book called purity code. And sure. so all over the country, they do these events to help kids make good decisions about sexuality. And the youth pastor had divided the boys and the girls on Saturday morning. And I was speaking to the parents and he came out and he was stunned because he had a 13-year-old son. And he mm -hmm. goes, oh, my gosh, I mm -hmm. didn't know my son would have seen pornography, mm -hmm. but all of these boys. Well, you know, today we have to almost assume that kids are going to see things that maybe we didn't see, especially at that age. Sure. So parents have to be proactive. They have to be intentional. And, you know, a lot of parents parent by circumstance and chance. And, uh, you know, I was just in a, in a conference last week, and I said to I'd say about 800 people. I said, how many of you received good, positive, healthy sex education from your parents when you were growing up? Four people raised their hand. Four. Mm -hmm. So what that meant was their parents didn't help them, say, with sex education. Sure. But that also meant that their parents weren't thinking about you know, the media because the television was on all the time. But in 2008, something happened. And now remember, 2008 is only you know 10 years ago. But in 2008, kids moved from watching more television to being online. Yes. And again, all online is not bad. Right. It's the way that they will live. It's the way that they react. Mm -hmm. It's the way that they uh, entertain, but it's also the way that they get their say sex education. Mm -hmm. Number one place today is the internet. And I'm not sure there's a lot of internet, um, that I wouldn't want my kids looking at. Mm -hmm. And I surely don't want them to be the, 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 I don't want the internet to be the, the primary way that kids are learning about sex education or pornography. Absolutely. And and as great as the, the church is, if, you're, if your child goes to church, uh, the truth is, and I've, I've heard this uh, from one of your talks before, that um, really mom is the most influential in a child's life. Dad is a distant second, beca just because dads so often aren't that in touch. Um, grandparents, you know, come up there and, and but the church is pretty far down the line. So if we are assuming that just because my child is in church every week, which is great, but that's not enough. We can't bury our heads in the sand. No, no, no. And, and you're, you're exactly right, Tom. I mean, the, the, the church is about number five. Now, that doesn't mean that the church doesn't influence. The job is actually to have the church come alongside families right. and help them succeed. We have a phrase at Homeward, where I work, that says one of the purposes of the church is to mentor parents and grandparents. The parents and the grandparents mentor their kids, and the legacy of faith continues to the next generation. That's how it, it should work. It doesn't always work that way. So as parents, we have to be you know, serious about you know, learning. For example, today we're, we're using media in a positive way. We are. There's yeah. people who are going to listen in on our conversation, how great it's like we're sitting at, you and I are two friends sitting at Starbucks, sure. and they're getting to listen in. Sure. Same time, they could easily switch out and see that pornography sure. or see some of the you know the more negative things um, so quickly, and you know that's that's what their kids are doing because their kids are online uh, for longer than they were on television, and television was like eight hours a day, and now online is you know even longer for sure. many. Sure. Let me go back uh, just to something I, I thought of while you were talking earlier, and that is. You say in, in your book, Understanding Your Teen, that um, there really is is no good time for the talk. I mean, for just like one one talk. And basically you, you were saying that you need to be having uh, appropriate, age-appropriate discussions 
when you know when a child is, is ready to ask whatever questions they're asking, but not just wait and save it all until the talk moment. Right, exactly. Well, you know, there's a there's actually a study that came out at, at Columbia University, not necessarily a Christian study. But the study said that the one talk could even do more damage because mm. typically the parents don't do a very good job of the one sure, talk. Sure, absolutely. And that means that the kids aren't willing to have any kind of dialogue after that because they're like, I'm not talking to mom or dad about it. So really what we're saying is is, is to have those conversations, at a, the younger the better, when it's developmentally appropriate, because you want them at the next stage to be able to, have, to ask the questions. You know, I, it would have never dawned on me to ask my parents about sex. Sure. They didn't talk about it. So mm-hmm. they weren't where I was going. So I learned it from my friends and, you know, any, anywhere I could find it as a kid because right. I was just curious. It was right. mysterious. Sure. So what we find is that when parents, even when kids are like three to five and they say, your parents will say, God made your body mm-hmm. and, and, and you're a boy and mm-hmm. God made your body to be good. And you're going to grow up to be like daddy. And, you know, you're going to grow up to be like mommy and, you know, just talking about that, well, at the next stage, six to nine, then they're going to be more open to, you know, they might be curious about a pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And so, again, you're not giving them everything, sure. but you're getting to, to, to open up the dialogue that mom and dad, grandma and grandpa are willing to have that conversation. Then you get to about age 10. Now, it's funny we're talking about teenagers. You know, my PhD is in, in adolescence, and I learned that it was 13 to 18. But today, nobody believes that. It's probably somewhere between 10 and 24. Okay. In fact, in Great Britain, here in this year, uh, Great Britain changed teenage to 10 to 24. Hmm. I, I got my PhD in, in Great Britain, and I would have been, been taught that you start at 10, which is kind of not pre-puberty, because puberty happens inside before you know things start changing on the outside, hmm. um, but all the way up to 24, because your brain kind of quits growing then. Okay. So really, that... The puberty time, 10 to 14, is a key age to have good conversations with kids. And that is the age, like I mentioned, that they're going to see pornography. So the question becomes, not that we're just talking about pornography today, but if is that their first look at sex is, is on their you know iPhone sure. with pornography, mm-hmm. or is it with parents right. having that awkward conversation? I mean, even I mean, I write books on this subject. At Homeward, we have all kinds of books on, on the subject. And my daughters, all three of them would say, Dad, when you talk to us about sex, you were awkward. Mm-hmm. You know, and I want to go, wait, no, I, I was cool. They go, no, <laughs> you were awkward. I just want you to know. Right. You know, it's going to be awkward. It is. But you still have those conversations. Absolutely. And we have lots of awkward conversations in life, but that's part of being a parent. And um, the less awkward you make it and yeah, and weird that you make it, the, the more yeah. re- received it, it'll be. Uh, Jim, you are um, the host of Homeward Radio Broadcasts, which has over a million listeners each day. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that yeah. show? Well, it's funny because here you I are, and I are talking, and, and I never wanted to I, – I didn't listen to Christian radio, I'll just be uh-huh. honest with you. That doesn't mean – my wife did, so you could always tell who was in the car because, you know, one was tuned to oldies but goodies. Right, that right. That was me. That's right, That's sure. The station. Sure. And that was her. Um, and then one day, a man called me up. He's the, um, he's the owner of the largest Christian company in the world for, for media. And he said, would you be interested to, to uh, go on primetime radio, 24 of the top 25 markets in five weeks? Mm. And I started laughing hilariously because I said, you don't want me. I <laughs> right. said, I don't, I don't, <laughs> you listen don't even to listen to that. <laughs> right. goes, well, that's why we want to use you because, you know, we need some fresh questions, some, you know, and it was going to be a uh, more of a family type thing. Okay. So we got involved in it and we did that, you know, strongly for about 10 years. And then I backed off of it. So you're actually looking at something where I'm still on radio. We still have a podcast. um, But we backed off a bit because it was taken over my life. And I love to speak and I love to write. Right. Mm -hmm. And I thought that because I was, well, you know this, Tom. You know, when you're prepping for somebody, it's taken, you know, it it takes hours. We're doing it every day. Wow. And so I said to my my executive producer, I said, you know, I want to take a six-month sabbatical. And he said, Jim, you're never going to come back. And I said, why? He goes, you're too, you like people too much. And he said, you know, you're, you're, you have this love for, you know, getting the word out via radio and podcasting, but you also have this love to be around people. And you know what? I, I didn't go back. So what we have now on our, we have podcasts, mm-hmm. which are a shorter amount of time. Sure. And then we're still on, I think, 400 stations, but that's, they're 
their revamped material. I have to come into the studio ever so often and kind of revamp it. But like I just had Gary Chapman on my show, mm-hmm. who wrote Five Languages, Love and sure. Ten. I think I think it was in 2012 <laughs> when we had him. But still so very, the, very yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. Well, the conversations that you and I are having. Yeah. It, it will go on. Sure. So that's the beauty of, of media. But uh, so I'm not as involved in the the radio world as and you know as I used to. But our podcasts, Homer podcasts, which are at homer.com, are uh, are listened to by about fifty two thousand people a awesome. year a week. Awesome. So that's cool. And then us uh, and we are on radio, but they just we can't get it off. We can't have people because <laughs> it's too good, too good of material. Uh, homeward.com is your main site. That's homeward.com. Jim, uh, so we've been talking about how different it is now compared to when you and I were younger, whereas uh, people in in our age group um, would have kind of had to go looking for exposure to these things. And what I heard you say earlier was it it kind of it, a child doesn't even really have to look necessarily. I mean, it can just pop up, and all of a sudden, they are exposed. And and one of the one of the things that, that's happening now is are the social media sites and uh, apps that are so readily available out there. And and so I wondered if I could talk to you a little bit about that for parents, for grandparents, um, and and your probably parents are aware of, of most of the sites, but let's talk just briefly yeah. about those. So, you know, yeah, I mean, well, but, let me just do this. Yeah. I mean, they have to be students of the culture. Parents do because we find Homeward is the largest provider of parenting seminars in the U.S. We mm-hmm. go to churches. We have 27 speakers and, you know, we speak on these subjects. And what we find is that a lot of parents and grandparents aren't as aware of these apps um, as we think they are. Okay. So, you know, that's where I, I think I interrupted where you were going, but, but it's really important that we do become, you know, students of at least the basic aspects of apps because the kids are going to be experts on it. And, you know, so we have to learn something about social media, definitely. Sure. And the ones that we've heard about are Instagram. Sure. Uh, very, sure. very common. Right, you know, uh, there was, there's actually a, I'll, I'll start a little farther. You know, a lot of us got on MySpace. Oh, sure. Nobody remembers MySpace. Uh-huh. And yet, you know, it was sold by three college students for $540 million. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and we had Facebook. And Facebook today is the third largest country in the world. You've got China, India, Facebook. And Facebook is about ready to take over. Um, uh, India, and so it'll be the second largest country, groups of people. But here's the fascinating thing, Tom, is that for teenagers, they're bound, they're the only demographic that's leaving Facebook. Right. Why? Because their parents, the parents are, are on, on there, Facebook. and their grandparents. grandparents are right, right. Now that the grandparents are on, they're like, well, I'm not going on there. <laughs> so they moved to, you mentioned Instagram, so they moved to things like Instagram, uh, Snapchat, uh, we, we're going to call this a social network, and it's partly social network, partly not, but definitely YouTubers. Sure. Mm-hmm. And so, again, their way of communication um, is 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 different now. They love video. They love, and you can do video, and you can do photos. So you're not going to typically text like you know. In my girls, when I first when they first started, when they first got their phones, you know, at first they would answer the phone, and then they'd not answer the phone, and then I'd have to text them. You're right. And then they're like, Dad, you know, text. <laughs> Come on. Right. So, you know, now they're going to do things with, with uh, you know, photos and video and movement. And that's both good, but it's also somewhat scary. Let's take Snapchat, for example. Okay. Snapchat is, is the, the fastest growing, you know, social media mm-hmm. right now mm-hmm. with kids. Mm-hmm. And when it started, it was basically a sexting tool. Right. Some guys in college started it. I have in my office, I have the emails when they were trying to sell it for hundreds of millions of dollars, mm-hmm. which they did. But they were saying this is the, the best sexting tool because at that point, Snapchat didn't have all the cutesy little things. Mm-hmm. Parents will remember that now Snapchat has – you can have butterflies on right. your nose. You know, right. these cutesy little mm-hmm. things. And yet back at that time, somebody would take a picture of themselves, say, naked or be sexually provocative. They would send it to their boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. And then it would dissolve in 30 seconds. Right. And – so the big selling point was it would dissolve in 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. What they forgot was you could take a photo of a photo. Yes, so screenshot. You know, kids like, are, yeah. are dumb. They're taking photos of the naked picture, mm-hmm. and now they have them stored. So, again, I'm not saying that all Snapchat is bad. I am saying that parents need to understand that that 
tool is still a a sexting tool sure. as, well, as well as other sure. as well as other. Sure. So I was speaking to some youth workers recently, and they said, "Do we we know the bad stuff about sex, Snapchat? But all of our kids are on Snapchat. Do we do we do we go to Snapchat mm. and and you know do it in a good way?" And that's a big debate that a mm-hmm. lot of us who work with teens are: right. is do we just walk away from a sure. uh, one of the most influential social media sites in the world, Absolutely. or do we jump into it? Mm-hmm. And we have to be careful mm-hmm. with all of these. So, so again, Facebook is still around, uh, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube. Now, again, they move quickly. For mm-hmm. example, if you just talk about dating sites, you know, I, when I, you know, I mean, I've been married forty-four years, so it's been a long time. But it never dawned on me that one out of six people would meet their spouse in 2018 online. Sure. So now, because kids are so used to what's going on with with their social media, they they have no problem moving to uh, some of the sites. Some of the sites are good. Um, eHarmony.com. Right. They that's they, they do compatibility. It's mm-hmm. a lot better than say Tinder, mm-hmm. which is just looking at you know sure. pictures. Yes. So, yeah. but kids are so used to this that for them it it, it, it it's not even an eye in their mind. Of course, I could I, I could meet somebody online and I could you know get serious about them. I, I'd go hook up with them. Well, that's not what we want to see, but that is where it's going. So again, parents have to figure out, do I, how do I monitor this in my home and what's good and what's bad? Because for mm-hmm. example, gaming, a lot of games are, are fun. Sure. And you've got kids who are now, you know, they're not out, you know, being crowsing around, they're actually playing games. But then we find out that if you are, are gaming for two hours a, a day, mm-hmm. that that's actually doing something to your brain and the stimulation package in your brain. And that may not be as good. And they're becoming antisocial. Mm-hmm. And then they want to move to games that, you know, have deep uh, violence or, sure. you know, sexual innuendos. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm not saying this for every kid. So that's why I call this personally tailored discipleship. We have to tailor the discipleship for each kid. I have a daughter who she's, she is in her 30s. She's a teacher now. She doesn't even have a Facebook account because she thinks it's kind of silly. Right. She Instagrams. She has two, you sure. know, my, our two grandchildren. And I look at Instagram every day because I want to see the pictures of the grandkids. But you have some where that's not a temptation to them, and then you have somebody else where that's a temptation to them to go on to deeper, you know, uglier sure. uh, areas of life. Sure. Um, and, and the thing you mentioned, sexting. If if our uh, some of the listeners don't know what that is, it, it's uh, showing partially nude or nude pictures yeah. of yourself. And and un- unfortunately, um, and you mentioned this in your book uh, that that's kind of the starting point. Yeah, we call it first base, yeah. the new first base. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so with that, uh, and a lot of times you'll see this with a middle school kid. You know, there's their their emotional involvement with the opposite sex outlives where they can you know, they don't know what's going on. Their emotional involvement exceeds their maturity level, say. So they'll do it and think it's funny and forget that that person is taking a picture and then sending it to yes. other friends. Yes. And um, and next thing you know, it went across a state line and now they're a sex offender and you're sure. aware of a of an eighth grade boy in Boston, Massachusetts, who is on the sex registry because he took his friend, sent a picture of his girlfriend without any clothes on. He's in eighth grade. He did what a lot of eighth grade boys would do. He sent it to some other boys, but one happened to not live in Massachusetts, lived in Vermont. And he, you know, this kid gets arrested. Mm. And so now that's going to affect his college. It's going to affect his work, you know, until he's at least in his forties sure. and it could be all of his life. So, you know, they're not thinking about that. You know, when you're in eighth grade, you're just, you're not, that was fun. But yet today, as parents, we have to help them understand some of the ramifications and consequences of poor decisions on social media. If you're just uh, listening in, uh, I'm Pastor Tom. This is the 24 Today podcast. And uh, you can find out more about me at 24today.org or also tomwhitesell.com. But most of all, I'd like you to find out about Jim Burns. I'm talking to him about His book, which is entitled Understanding Your Teen, and it's one of many of his books that are on uh, the family, teenagers. He has books on marriage. There's daily devotional books, so many things that you can find from Jim. If you just uh, get on his website at homeward.com, homeward.com, or you can search Amazon. Real easy search. You can find out uh, about his books, his author page. You'll just be amazed at all the different things. Uh, Jim, let's talk briefly about your website, homeward.com. Lots of good things. you got a blog there. 
daily devotional, marriage newsletter, culture updates, good stuff. Yeah, a lot of good stuff. You know, it's funny, Tom, that I was in South Africa. We have a ministry that mirrors ours. And they said, a lot of you Americans have, you, the, your blogs, I mean, your uh, websites are only trying to sell something. Uh-huh. And I, I actually looked at ours and said, you know what, we're selling too much stuff. What we need to do is, is offer free content for people around the world. And so we closed it down for a short time and came back with, you know, thousands of podcasts and thousands of, of blogs and articles and tip sheets. And I, that's when I started uh, drjimburns.com blog. And um, what we found was that people today, the way they search for information about their kids is they're not going to, I mean, I'm grateful that many people are reading Understanding Your Team, sure. but, you know, they're going to a blog or, or whatever. Right. So we started saying, what are the needs of parents? You mentioned it. One of the needs of a parent is, is to understand culture. So we have something called the Culture Blog, which blew our minds. Last year, two years ago, we received um, in the top 50 culture blogs in the world. So you had CNN, NPR, uh, you know, China Culture Update, all these different things, and then our blog. And, um, and they liked it because it was relevant, hmm. and uh, it takes about four or five minutes to read. Yeah. It comes out every Friday. It's free. Mm-hmm. We never ask for money on them. Mm-hmm. And so we have those blogs. We have my blog. Uh, we have uh, a marriage, right? A marriage yep. newsletter, a parenting newsletter, daily devotional, and it's it's been a great thing because people can just go to it. They can sign up. It shows up in their mailbox if they don't like it. Um, you know, they can dump it. Most people like it because it keeps growing. I think sure. we sent out over seven million last year. Wow! And uh, so that's an exciting thing for us. And uh, as well as, you know, the articles and the mm-hmm. tip sheets and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, so, and there's something. Yeah, yeah, something yeah, we, for everyone there. If you want to buy our books, we're happy to <laughs> you know, put those in front of them. And we have some, like, we're going to announce, well, next week, we have two new video series for churches and for couples. One is on understanding your teens. So we have a video now. Of, it's a great video. I mean, I've seen it. It's, it's literally coming out this coming week. And then uh, we have one on the first few years of marriage oh, yeah. that Doug Fields and I, we wrote the book, but then I, we also have a video series. So any, any, pretty much any book that Homeward has, there it is. Yeah. yeah the, one, the first few years of marriage. Um, so important. Those yeah. eight ways to strengthen your, I do is the subtitle. Yeah. Good. One of the things Doug and I, on that book, one of the things we realized was that uh, young parent, we wish we would have had a book like that. Uh-huh, because sure. We married. Um, but what we realized was that, you know, we really did, we hadn't built the right foundation. Mm early in our marriage. So you have getting ready for marriage, and then you kind of move to, you know, as you get older, you go, wow, we need help. But uh, we were really excited about that particular book, The First Few Years of Marriage, because it's building a foundation um, that sometimes you're just too busy. You're getting, you know, acquainted with each other. You're maybe making a baby. You're definitely working and trying to figure out how to do it. So that's been a that's been a neat thing. So we're excited. That book is, is also new, and, and we have that video coming out. So any book that Homeward House pretty much has a video that people can use yep. in either small groups and churches mm-hmm. or as individuals. Good. Jim, we're heading down to the home stretch here of, of our talk together, and uh, we still have some more information I'd like to give out for parents and grandparents just to help you know a little bit more about uh, creating a media-safe home. So let me give you some different uh, apps uh, and, and if you want to comment on any of those, uh, of course, these are ones we're more familiar with, Twitter, Tumblr, uh, Facebook, Pinterest, Google+. Plus. Um, but, but here's some. Let me give you a list that, that's got some that may be a little unfamiliar, but we need to know about them. These are texting and messaging apps. WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Um, also, Kik, K-I-K. Um, and then there's, there's Facebook Messenger, which we're more familiar about with. But WhatsApp and Kik. In particular, um, a, a child really very young, 12 years old. I mean, you know, they, they have uh, so-called um, age requirements, but really they don't check to verify that. And so a child can get on, and a child can get on these, these apps without even having uh, like a, you know, a, a paid uh, phone company that, you know, that, so they can, they can be on Wi-Fi at McDonald's or whatever, and just get on these these apps, and who knows who they're talking to, but yeah. you want to talk briefly about WhatsApp and Kick? Yeah, well, just a couple of things. One is those are very popular, because kids are going to keep looking. I mean, sure. it's like you have clothes that were popular last year, but they're not popular this this year. Luckily for me, whatever my clothes are, <laughs> I just keep wearing the same ones. They come yeah, back. Absolutely. 
but but so when you look at something like Kick or even even What's Up um, app, both of those have international connotations as well mm. because it, it's actually like a free phone call when you say that you're online. So you get online, and then you can connect to the world through these. Where there's certain when you even when you text, there's certain uh, costs to it. Right. Uh, it, for example, if you if you have the same provider. Uh, AT and T. Well, then there's not a cost. But if you if if you had Verizon, I had AT and T. It's going to cost. But with those apps, it doesn't cost. Right. right. So somebody can try to befriend you. And I use uh, WhatsApp because I'm in. I was in Chile last week, and you know, so I, that's how I'm connecting on who's going to pick me up and take me to the conference and do all that because it's a free app. What I worry about is that kids don't necessarily have the control over some of those kinds of things, and so they, and they want to have as many friends as possible. So as parents, just learn what it is. So go online. You can learn what it is. Yep. Um, and then also have sites like, uh, I think you mentioned we, before Teen, we... Uh, TeenSafe. TeenSafe.com. TeenSafe. 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 Yeah. Um, Covenant Eyes. Yep. There's one called Triple X, XXXChurch.com, mm-hmm. yep. which mm-hmm. is actually a Christian site. Right. They kind of, you can go into their stuff and they will teach you the good, the bad, and the ugly. But yes. there is good too. Yes. So learn the good, the bad, and the ugly. And don't make it all so bad that your kids will never want to talk to you about. Sure. So parents, you can go to these sites and and yes. just in a minute or, or two, you can view a quick video on what these are and and uh, they'll, they'll be so helpful for you. We're, we're familiar with Skype. Here's one maybe you're not so familiar. Uvu is another uh, similar one to what we were just talking about. It's O-O-V-O-O. Yeah. So what's happening is, is you're going to see, you know, we, it's like brands, you know, we all, if I, you and I, at one time I might've said, Hey, do you want to go get a Coke Cola? Sure. Well, that could have been anything, but we just used the name Coke. Right. Uh-huh. Skype is going to be the name that people probably use because it was one of the first and it's the biggest, but today there's other ones and they have, some of them have the exact same thing. It's just that they're, maybe they have better bandwidth or they have something else or there's a, there's a, a for them, there's an advertising uh-huh. part to them. Sure motivation sure so as parents again we just we need to find out what our kids are on and um you know i find that with parents one of the things i say is is you know befriend them on their social media sites don't engage with them like you know start befriending all of their friends or making comments but you know kind of silently quietly befriend them and let them befriend you when they're younger they're going to be open to that if they're older you know you're you're young adult is going to say, you know, pound sand, mom or dad, I don't sure. want you to be on my site, even if they're not doing bad stuff. But I find that with with younger teens, that's a great way to do it because then you're at least kind of knowing what's going on in their world. It's like kind of observing. I used to do this. We had a van. I always would drive because I love to see what the kids would be talking about. So I keep lowering the mm-hmm. radio. So right. I you mentioned that in your book, right? Yeah, which which in some ways is what we do with some of the social media too. So befriend them, know know what's going on. So be, become be on their their friends list, uh, so that yeah. and you can kind of make it clear. Actually, would would that be a requirement for yeah, for you as a parent? Yeah, it wasn't our in the burn zone. Okay, you know, and our deal was we said, look, we promise we're not going to embarrass you. But there were a few times where we had to have at least with one of our daughters, we had to have a few conversations because we felt she was so innocent that she didn't understand what was taking place. And so we said, hey, you're not going to like this conversation. However, we were on your Facebook, for, at that point it was Facebook, we were on your Facebook page, and you befriended people that you don't know. What if that guy isn't sure. you know, 16, lives here in California, but he's you know 27 and lives in Texas, and he's a sexual predator? Sure. And he gave us a chance. And, my, and of course, our daughter didn't go, oh, mom and dad, you're amazing. She went, oh, give me <laughs> Right, it. right. You, know, you guys are so old-fashioned. But the point being is that we wanted to to, to – help her learn the power of, of social sure. media. And uh, so, you know, it took a lot of work on our part. I thought, we're, you know, making babies are fun and then kids are, you know, you're changing diapers and you're exhausted, but then you, they get to be teens. Yes. You know, what in the world? This Absolutely. Is, this is more tiring and stressful than I ever thought, of, you know, thought it was. So yeah. we all need to have people come alongside of us to help us, you know, come up with some of this Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Just briefly, I want to mention a, another category, a uh, live Streaming apps are now very popular because um, the, the young people uh, aren't really so satisfied with watching recorded things. They they want to see something live and at the moment. So there's you now. There's also Periscope. Uh, there's there's Mercop. There's 
um, live stream, YouTube Connect, Facebook live video. So these are things that that people are wa- wanting to see at the moment, brushing their teeth or you know, what you know, whatever else they might be doing. But at the moment, oh, exactly. And you know, I used. Uh, I mean, it's old fashioned compared to what you're talking about, but it's the same thing. I used a live stream today. I was walking our dog. I have a grandson who lives in Texas, and he's three. And uh, so I FaceTimed his dad, who was at home. His mom is my daughter, and she was at work. And um, and all of a sudden, he comes in. He goes, Grandpa, I'm going to the gym, because his dad was taking him to the gym for his dad, mm-hmm. I'm sure. And then we talked about Halloween, and we talked about what he had done last night. And we had this, as I'm, and he goes, show me the dog. Show me, he loves our dog. Show me the dog. And so I showed him the dog. I showed him the sunrise. So... There's beautiful things to that. At the same time, think about what people are doing now on the sexual aspect sure. where they're we talking about sexting, but people are are doing the same thing now with live streaming and you're like, wow, this is this is getting sure. out of control. Sure. So what's good for a you know three year old grandson isn't good for two teenagers who are, you know, experimenting in a way that aren't uh, it's not healthy, right? And I'm just going to throw out some some more apps, and then we're, we'll move on here quickly and bring this tune in. But there's one called Xpire, which is X P I R E. There's one called Frankly. There's one called Phantom. Uh, Jim, would would you would you suggest? Uh, uh, well, well, I think that in your book you suggest one of the things is to not allow the the teen or the child to to have their phone in, in their room, you know, all night long, that there's a there's a certain time where they've got to put it in the charging base out in the living room or whatever. Yeah, no, I'm big on that. I, I, I don't think that every kid who's online in their bedroom with the door closed is doing something horrible. Mm-hmm. But I am saying because of Wi-Fi, they have so much ac- more access to, um, you know, negative stuff. So if sure. you've got a 15-year-old son, I'm not saying that he's – doing pornography, but if he's in there for five hours, he's probably gaming or doing mm-hmm. something. And, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you, you want to know what your kids are doing. So sure. I believe strongly that you don't let kids sleep with their phones. Okay. Uh, at Homework's blog, we just had a, one of the blogs on the, the lack of sleep that teens are getting today, and it's really atrocious, mm. the amount of sleep. They need more sleep. Mm. What's keeping them up is that they're answering their texts in the oh, middle of sure. the night and all sure. this. So. My suggestion, I give an illustration in the book about a family that I know well, that they all dock their phone. And they actually dock their phone at 930. That's pretty early. But they dock their phone at 930 if, with the age of their kids and them, um, they may have to you know, text or you know, do something in the kitchen, but they keep it out of the bedroom. Mm. And, uh, and I know that people keep their phone, even adults keep their phone sometimes because they're thinking there's going to be a phone call or whatever. And I, I, I understand that, but at the same time, I think we have to be really careful with kids if they're not sleeping. I, I took a photo of my daughter who was in college, and I, I just I walked into her bedroom, and she was home for the for the holiday, and she was sleeping with her phone, and she had the phone like she was cuddling up next to the phone, okay. and it was funny. So I took a picture, <laughs> wow. and, and I said to my wife, now again, she's a college student, so she's an adult. What do you do with an adult? But I said, this mm. is not good mm. and yet it was cute we all as a family sure. laughed and we sent it around the family and sure. whatever becca with her new boyfriend as well okay I said. okay but the point being is that's actually dangerous because becca then is not getting the sleep that she needs if she's you know cuddled up next to her phone it should so we have to make rules in our house that you know this is when you even with our when our kids were in college we said here's what we do this is our house you're not we're not going to tell you what to do in college but we're going to dock our phones, and so we all dock our phones at a certain time. And you're paying for the the phone, and so you yeah. should have have yeah. some say in it. Now, um, I'm I'm assuming you know their passwords. So they're, well, they're, when our kids were little. I don't. Oh, know that well, my kids are older, or or to get onto their phone when your kids are when Absolutely. when your kids are little, so you know. If we're buying the phone, then we have the password. And also, not only do we have the password, but we say if you break the phone, you're paying for okay. it. If you lose the phone. You're paying for it. And that means they're going to have. For our, we have all girls. They were doing some babysitting and whatnot. They just want. Well, my other friends, my friends' parents bought them a new phone mm. when they lost it or broke it. We went, mm. Sorry, that doesn't happen here because we want to teach them responsibility. Sure. You know, if you look at parenting teens, the bottom line isn't that they become obedient, but that they become responsible adults. Mm. And I would add, who love God. Well, to become responsible adults. One of the major responsibilities today is what you and I have been talking about, creating media safe home, um, having a healthy relationship with the opposite sex, 
you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. Well, as parents, that's why we have to lean into that. Mm. Jim, you, uh, I want to close with this. You, you mentioned a purity code in, yeah. in your book. It's a purity code pledge. Right. And, and it's, uh, do you want to t- tell me a little bit about that? It's, yeah. In honor of God, my family, and my future spouse, I commit to sexual purity. Yeah. Um, no, I love that pledge, and we're yeah. looking for a million kids, and we actually think we've had it. A million kids make that pledge. It does better when their parents are engaged than if it's just at a conference where somebody like me was speaking. And, uh, and it involves four things that are all scriptural, um, that you honor God with your body, mm-hmm. that you renew your mind for good. I always tell kids the greatest, most powerful sex organ is not your private parts. It's your mind. Mm. Um, right. Then right out of the, the living New Testament, or the living Bible, right. uh, not the Old Testament, turn your eyes from worthless things mm-hmm. and then guard your heart. Mm-hmm. So we're saying to parents, and this has to do with what you and I have been talking about today, how do we teach our kids to guard their heart? The Bible says in Proverbs, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Yeah. So how do we teach them to guard their heart when it comes to um, not just sexuality and media, but when it comes to their faith, when their life, their money, how they live life. And if we can teach them that, then I think they're going to become those responsible adults, and I would add who love God, much more uh, effectively than if we put no energy into that. We just parent by circumstance and chance. Sure. Jim, it's been a real honor to have you and on, on this podcast, and I know that, that uh, those who listen are really going to benefit from this so much, and I just encourage everyone to get Jim's book, among all you know, all of his other books, uh, "Understanding Your Teen." Um, also, head on over to, to Amazon. You can also um, listen to this one on Audible. There's other uh, Audible uh, books that Jim has. Um, head on over to Homeward.com as well. Find out so many things uh, about Jim and all the different things that he's offering. Um, Jim, is there any just one last any anything that comes to your mind in particular? You know, when it comes to to, to raising teens, or any encouragement that you have for for those that are kind of in the daily struggle. Well, Tom, I would just say that you know the teenage years is transition. Mm-hmm. So the good news is is they're not going to be teens all of their life. Some think when they have kids who are like 25, 26, sure. 27, still acting like teens, sure. but it's a transition. So you know, make the most of it, enjoy them. At it, during this season, even with its ups and downs and experimental phases, and know that you know if you do it right, they're going to become responsible adults, and uh, you will move the relationship from being the parent of a teen to a a you're still the parent, but it's kind of an adult to adult right. relationship. Right. That's that's the beauty of that transition. Thanks yeah. for what you do. Thanks Thank you, for uh, all you do. And and uh, if anybody you know who's listened to this, um, you know what? My guess is they're doing a really good job. Not. Their kids aren't coming up to them and they're saying trying, thanks yeah. to great parents, but they're, sure. they're doing a great job because they're, you know, they're trying to get all the information they can. Sure. Again, this is the 24 Today Podcast. You can find out more about me, Tom Weitzel, at TomWeitzel.com or uh, 24today.org. And um, uh, just uh, remember to, to, to keep watching us. If you would like this, if you would subscribe, if, if you would share this, it would be very, very helpful for both Jim and I. Remember, there's still time left in this day to live life. If this podcast has been helpful for you and you haven't already subscribed, just uh, just go to the subscribe button that you'll see on the page and subscribe. That way you'll make sure that you get everything that I put on the podcast the moment that it's available. And if it's helpful for you, it probably would be helpful for someone that you know as well. If you could send them a link or tell them about the podcast and then also um, comment on the particular podcast where, wherever you're at rate it if you will and that will help others to be able to see and hear about the podcast